Before we get going, just some brief housekeeping. I'm sure you all can read, but kind of some highlights. This presentation is being recorded for all of our purposes. Um, you will receive a recording of this and some workshop resources after the session. And then expect a follow-up email with the in-pink survey and additional next steps. And just general housekeeping, um, please raise your hand, use the chat box, and uh, be sure to mute, unmute properly. Thank you all for uh, your patience with the continuing webinar. So go ahead, next slide, please, Nan. All right, so a brief agenda. We'll go over the application overview, the planning area map tutorial, then we'll go into next steps breakout rooms. So if you do have really specific questions about your projects, uh, the breakout rooms are a great opportunity to do so, and then move into a Q&A. And as Riley said down there in the chat, we are covering information about the implementation grants as well here for the rural and tribal workshops, or this is the rural and incorporated workshop, sorry. I've working many a workshop, but that's all right. So if we can advance to the next slide, please, Nan. So what are the learning objectives today? What are we hoping to get out of this? Well, learn about the TCC implementation and planning grant opportunities. And like I said, this workshop is tailored to rural and an unincorporated areas. So heads up if you are uh, from one of those communities, thanks for being here. We will review the grant components and the application process. And we will have a Google My Maps tutorial to start your planning and project map area. So you don't have to have access to GIS to do some of these things, which is a great advancement. And then also we'll have an opportunity to discuss our potential application with SGC, the technical assistants, the TA providers, and other potential applicants. Next slide, please, Nan. So we'll get into some welcome and introductions as we've set the stage for what we're doing here today. If you're a participant, if you will please introduce yourself in the chat, you know, name, organization, pronouns, so that'd be great. My name's Clancy Taylor. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm with the California Coalition for Rural Housing. Next slide, please, Nan. And I'm going to hand it over to Anna real quick be, to introduce the whole slew of technical assistance providers that uh, are here to help all of you out with the TCC process. All right, thank you, Clancy. Um, and as Clancy mentioned, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Feel free to state your name, your organization. Um, and as folks do that, um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, so my name is Ana Cuevas Flores, and I am an associate with Estelano Advisors. And so just to give you a sense of our role um, on the TA team, Estelano Advisors is the lead coordinator for the TCC Technical Assistance Team along with our other two partners, Arup and Civicwell. Um, collectively, we are a third party team of consultants, organizations, and firms that provide technical assistance for the TCC program in collaboration with the Strategic Growth Council. And we have been involved with the TCC program since round one and are happy to continue with technical assistance through this upcoming round, round five. Um, but as you can see here on the screen, um, we do not do this alone. Um, again, on the lead team, we have Arup and CivicWell. Um, and we also have a group of more specialized technical assistance providers that comprise the broader technical assistance team, um, including Enterprise, um, which specialize in housing. Um, we have uh, the California Development um, CDRG, um, which focus on the greenhouse gas um, emissions quantification portion, primarily for the implementation grant. Um, as Clancy mentioned, we have California Coalition for Rural Housing. We also have the National Indian Justice Center, um, California Relief and Feral Law Strategies. Um, so today for this workshop, you'll get to hear from Estelana Advisors and California Coalition for Rural Housing. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to my colleagues uh, from Estelana Advisors to introduce themselves. So I'll pass it over to Riley. Thanks, Anna. Um, my name is Riley O'Brien. I'm a senior analyst at Estelano Advisors and um, the project manager for the TCC technical assistance team. Uh, so I'm really excited to see you all here today and to learn more about your uh, visions for the TCC program for your communities. And um, I will note also that Estelano Advisors, we've been 
um, application technical assistance providers since uh, round one of the TCC program. So we've seen this program uh, evolve and change over the years. Um, and you know we're we're really excited to see you all take the next step in uh, making this program uh, continue to grow. And so I'll pass it over to my colleague Nan. Thanks, Ravi. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Nan. I'm associated with the Salon Advisors, um, and I'll be mostly helping with um, mapping during the application process. And I'll also go over the mapping tutorial later in the pre presentation. And I'll hand it over to Kayla. Hello, uh, my name is Kayla McDonald and Sina. I'm representing the Civic Well team today. I'm a senior project manager. Um, along with EA, we've also been involved since uh, round one of this program. Definitely looking forward to meeting a lot of you. Thank you for putting your names in the chat. And I will pass it on to, um, I'm not sure, Riley, who should be next, but please help. <laughs> no problem. I believe um, we will. Uh, just pass that back to um, Anna to introduce the Strategic Growth Council, who is not here um, yet, but they'll be joining us later for our breakout rooms uh, to answer all your questions and, and chat more about the program. Great. Thank you all for your introductions. And as Riley mentioned, yes, we will have uh, staff from the California Strategic Growth Council joining us later for the Q&A session, um, part of the breakout rooms. Um, but just to give you a brief overview of um, the Strat California Strategic Growth Council, also known as SGC. Um, SGC is a statewide multi-agency council that was established in 2008 uh, to support sustainable growth through various activities, including policy coordination and community investment. Um, their vision is to provide healthy, thriving, and resilient communities for all. And their mission is to coordinate and work collaboratively with public agencies, communities, and stakeholders to achieve sustainability, equity, economic prosperity, and quality of life for all Californians. Um, so with that, we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so since the inception of the TCC program, there have been four rounds of planning grants awarded all throughout the state. And you can see a list of these past awardees here on this map. In the most recent round, um, round four, there were seven applicants that were awarded planning grants. Um, but again, the number of awardees varies depending on funding available and number of applicants um, as seen throughout the rounds. I also want to note that um, in round four, um, we did have uh, planning grant awardees, um, which included more counties and it expanded the program into tribal communities, unincorporated communities, and um, more of Northern California. Uh, so next slide. Um, so like uh, the planning grants, there have also been um, four rounds of implementation grants awarded um, throughout the state. Uh, given that the size of the implementation grant awards um, are much larger, we see a smaller number of awardees. Um, but I also want to note that um, in these past rounds, there have not been any tribal or unincorporated um, grantees yet, but we hope um, this changes over the next and uh, with this upcoming round. Um, next slide. Um, so that leads into round five. Um, and I just want to make a, a note before I begin to describe um, the two grant types. Um, the final guidelines for round five have not been released yet, and thus the final funding amounts have not been confirmed. Um, so these um, upcoming slides are just um, estimates. Again, we encourage everyone to look at the round five guidelines once they have been finalized to confirm information um, regarding amounts for the grants. Um, so historically, the TCC program has provided two grant types, um, and these two grant types are the planning grant and implementation grant. Um, so for the planning grants, um, they are up to 300,000 per grant. Um, these grants and proposals are meant to be community-led with self-determined projects. Uh, proposals with these grants include 
planning activities um, that prepare communities for future funding opportunities, such as the TCC implementation grant. And the grant term um, for this grant is up to two years. For the implementation grant, um, these grants go up to 35 million per grant. These are neighborhood level proposals that include multiple coordinated and integrated projects. And the grant term is up to five years. Next slide. So this, um, the round five draft guidelines present a new grant type known as the project development grant. Um, and these, this grant is up to 7 million per grant. And the purpose of this grant is really to provide bridge funding to create shovel ready projects, um, funding such activities such as pre-development work for basic infrastructure activities and other previously identified projects. And this is a, a grant term up to two years. Um, the technical assistance team does not know um, the role that TA will play with this grant um, right now. As such, this workshop will focus primarily on the planning and implementation grant only. For now, we encourage folks to reach out to SGC if you have any questions regarding the project development grant as we work how this is going to look out um, with the technical assistance process. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to Clancy to go over the um, applications. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. And all right, so application overview and timeline. Again, thank you all for being here. You're already ahead of the game in terms of the application timeline. So we'll get going on the eligible lead applicant types. So I know there's a lot of agencies on here. I, I know you all can read them, so I'll just kind of go over some common ones we see in the rural and unincorporated space. So these would be local governments of some form, including the county, say for an unincorporated area, community-based organizations who are already doing work in the area, nonprofits. And so there's a real wide range of actors. It can be nonprofits, CDFIs, joint powers authorities, governmental authorities, um, California or um, other Native American tribes. So there's a wide range. And uh, this is oftentimes one of the things that, you know, it takes a team to do but uh, the lead applicant will have to be one of these types of organizations. Next slide, please. All right, so what are some of the things that we will need to include within this whole application? So the planning grant, um, you will need to do things including the eligibility and threshold documentation. You will need some letters of support from local government authorities. Um, there is some brief narratives. It is by no means the lift of an implementation grant. However, the planning application does require some narrative, work plan, and budget work. Uh, next slide, please. And then the implementation application components, which are look very similar, I know, right now to the planning grants. However, so again, you'll have to make sure it's an eligible area with the appropriate thresholds. You'll still need those letters of support. And then the big thing is with the TCC implementation grants, you have to do narratives, work plans, and budgets for each strategy and project. So it, that can add to the length of the application, but you know, TCC wants to make sure that they know where that funding will be going. And you'll need to include the transformative elements of this transformative plan, as well as ready to start documentation. The big thing with TCC implementation grants, SGC wants those to be shovel-ready projects. Next slide, please. And I'm going to hand it over to Riley to get into some of these ticky-tacky eligibility and threshold requirements. What does that mean? What does that look like? Thank you, Clancy, and uh, thank you, Anna, as well. Um, so when we're looking at um, the whether it's the planning grant or implementation grant or project development grant for that matter, um, one of the main uh, things that you'll need to to start with is uh, determining whether or not your community is eligible. And there are a few ways to to determine eligibility uh, for both of these grant types um, and the eligibility eligibility requirements are similar for um, the planning and implementation grant types. The main difference is that for the planning grant, there's no maximum area, uh, whereas for the implementation grant, 
Um, there is a maximum area, uh, in most cases, five square miles, although for some rural communities, um, if you are designated a rural community by uh, the TCC guidelines, uh, which again are still being finalized, those um, guidelines do allow a project area of up to 10 square miles. But the overall purpose of this size limitation and of designing a planning or project area is to make sure that you're targeting your TCC investments into uh, specific communities, ideally specific neighborhoods, although um, it may not look like a, um, you know, an urban neighborhood necessarily, or um, it may not look the same as previous grantees uh, as the program evolves to now cover and encourage more applications from rural communities. So um, the idea here is to not only concentrate those benefits into a defined area, but also to make sure that the most needy communities of California are being prioritized. And to that end, there are um, some requirements specifically for incorporated areas and tribal communities. Uh, and then on the next slide, which we won't get to yet, we'll talk about the unincorporated uh, area requirements. So for incorporated areas uh, and tribal territories, at least a half uh, or over half of the planning area or project area must be uh, within either federally recognized tribal territories or census tracts that are considered disadvantaged according to the statewide um, metric known as Cal Enviro screen. So basically what that means is um, every census tract in California, which roughly corresponds to a portion of a neighborhood or a neighborhood or sort of sub-region of an area, is given a score in this uh, Cal Enviro screen tool that will uh, basically determine how much um, pollution and socioeconomic burden there is uh, on that community from you know, sources such as traffic such as um, uh, you, smog and other uh, types of uh, air pollution, as well as water pollution, groundwater water threats, and just socioeconomic vulnerability. So challenges that communities are facing, uh, whether that's through um, you know things like rent burden or uh, health challenges. So it's a way of just kind of uh, wrapping up a lot of different and of course very nuanced um, you know, challenges that are faced by many communities and just trying to ensure that state funding is being directed to the communities that need it most and have historically um, been uh, faced the most barriers. And so if you have at least 51% of your project or planning area in those communities, the remaining 49% must also at the very least be in what's determined as a low income community. And that um, is just a slightly wider range of communities throughout the state that do have uh, lower than um, sort of the median income um, of their communities or of the state uh, as determined by state law, in this case, Assembly Bill 1550. So um, I will note that uh, with these requirements, uh, the, if you are in an incorporated area, uh, if you are eligible for technical assistance, uh, we can support you on that. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but we can also, you can also get assistance from SGC on this topic. And then moving on to the next slide, I did wanna discuss the requirements for unincorporated communities. And those requirements uh, really do um, follow a lot of the, the same patterns. Uh, one uh, tool that can help you determine eligibility is um, the TCC mapping tool, which is available on the TCC website from last round, and it will be updated for round five in the coming weeks. Um, but the main difference here is that if you are in an unincorporated area, so a community that's not a city, not a tribal um, area, but rather a, a community that's governed directly by the county, then you actually have a few other ways that you can determine or that you can qualify for TCC. And um, one thing you'll qualify for right away is technical assistance. So our team, um, most likely Nan and I, but uh, the team including Clancy and Anna, 
and Kayla, we can help you determine if you're eligible. And in some cases, you can actually submit local data or data that um, is not tied to Cal Enviroscreen Screen to demonstrate eligibility. And so with that, we can move on to the next slide. Um, in addition to determining your eligibility and demonstrating your eligibility, you will um, also, as part of um, either grant type, be developing a narrative document. So for the planning grant, the narrative document is really one summary document where you can walk through various components of your community's um, composition, your community's needs, uh, your vision for using this TCC funding opportunity, and uh, describing the planning activities that you would fund. Uh, whereas for the implementation grant application, it's, it's basically all that plus a lot more. Um, for the implementation grant, you'll give an overview similarly of your planning or project area in that case. Um, but you will also give an overview of the projects you would like to fund. And uh, in turn, for each of those projects that you would like to fund with TCC implementation grant funding, you will need to develop a narrative for each. Uh, and then the last thing here is transformative elements on this list. Uh, I think Clancy touched on that a bit earlier, but essentially uh, transformative elements are broad goals and priorities of the TCC program. And so for the um, planning grant, your narrative will have to touch on at least one of those transformative elements. Whereas for the implementation grant, you will actually need to cover all of the transformative elements. And if we go on to the next slide, we can see what those are. Uh, again, these are broad policy priorities and also um, methods and um, ways to kind of have broader benefits from this funding source. So for example, if you are um, a TCC, if you're interested in the TCC planning grant, if you would like to do, let's say, um, community workshops to talk about solutions to um, affordable housing issues uh, and, and trying to make sure that community members can still afford to, to stay in the communities where they've lived their entire lives. Um, that could pretty easily tie into both community engagement and displacement avoidance as you would be engaging the community to um, determine ways to you know, maintain and retain um, communities and uh, even in poten potentially local businesses uh, to make sure folks can you know, afford to stay in the community. Um, but for a, um, but that's just one example, you could potentially touch on the other uh, transformative elements here. But again, for implementation grant, uh, it does kind of make, take each of these parts and combine all of those requirements into, uh, into a much larger, sort of menu of um, transformative plans. For the implementation grant, you will actually need to draft a plan for these first four transformative elements. So you'll have a plan for community engagement, a plan for displacement avoidance, a plan for workforce development, and for climate adaptation and resilience. And each of those plans will tie into the infrastructure projects that you would like to fund with the implementation grant. Last two points here, I mentioned the first four involve transformative plans. The last two are um, not in the same format necessarily, but they are very important requirements. And so leverage funding is kind of another name for match funding. Uh, for the implementation grant, there is a 50% match requirement. So that means you, uh, whatever funding amount you request from, um, SGC through the TCC implementation grant, it's usually up to $35 million. Uh, you will actually have to match 50% of that with um, your own sources from someone on the applicant team. Uh, oftentimes that is a local government agency, but it could be a nonprofit, it could be a you know philanthropic organization. Um, and if you are applying for a planning grant, you will not have to offer any of that match funding but one way that you can uh, improve your application is to talk about how you will try to access leverage funding or match funding in the future. Um, and then the uh, implementation grant only is the only one that requires this part, but there is a data collection and indicator tracking requirement. 
um, that essentially means that you're able to, you, you will describe how you will kind of monitor the progress and the potential benefits of your implementation grant. Um, but that's just for the implementation grant. And so moving on to the next uh, slide, we do wanna just uh, touch on a couple of other components here of the uh, application that do apply to both the uh, planning and the implementation grant. And uh, most things that apply to both, most if not all things will also apply to the project development grant. So one is a work plan. And for the planning grant, it's a um, it's one spreadsheet, essentially one Excel document where you just outline the, the timeline, the tasks and the deliverables for each of uh, the activities that you want to fund with TCC. For the implementation grant, it's that plus a specific work plan for each of the projects, because with infrastructure projects, as many of you know, there are a lot of nuts and bolts that you will need to iron out um, to demonstrate that you're ready and able to um, access those funds. And then moving on to the next slide, um, the story about budget is very similar. Uh, for the planning grant, you'll provide a budget that um, outlines all expenses by task, by cost description, cost type. And then for the implementation grant, you will have a budget for each project and then a summary budget that uh, sort of combines them all together. And then next slide, um, really last but not least, uh, when we're looking through the um, application requirements are letters of support. So um, I, you know, I believe we had mentioned this briefly earlier in terms of the uh, eligible applicants, but um, you will need to designate a lead applicant and at least one co-applicant. We recommend more than one co-applicant. And one of those, whether it's the lead or one of the co-applicants must be a public agency. So uh, the public agency, if it's a lead applicant will actually need to pass a formal resolution in their um, elected office, uh, you know, their, their voting body, whether that's a city council or a county board of supervisors, or um, in the case of a regional government, perhaps it's a, um, you know, regional council, they will need to pass a formal resolution as the lead applicant. As the co-applicant, if there's a nonprofit partner, a community organization, perhaps that is the lead applicant, the public agency will need to provide a letter of commitment. Next, there is also a requirement, um, regardless of who is the co-applicant, that the jurisdiction where you're applying, where your project area is located, that jurisdiction, whether again, it's the city or the county, their um, departments, related to specifically planning and public works, will each need to submit a letter. They could actually submit a joint letter is often the easiest way to fulfill this requirement, just to um, confirm that what you're applying for here in the TCC program, what um, the, the priorities that you've identified in the application are consistent with the local planning priorities that have been established through the um, legislative process. And then the last item here is site control. If you are, um, you know, if you are applying for an implementation grant, building anything, putting anything in the ground, or even if you are for a planning grant or implementation grant, planning to host events on any property that's not directly owned by the co-applicants, you know, directly city-owned property, for example, let's say it's a uh, high school gym or a, um, you know, local. Uh, local businesses, um, community center, meeting space, you will need to also uh, have a letter from them just committing to uh, offering that site uh, for any of those activities, whether it's a planning activity or a um, infrastructure project. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Anna now to uh, walk through the scoring criteria for the planning grant and the implementation grant. Great, thank you, Riley. Um, so now that you've heard a brief overview of the application components for both grants, um, I'll be reviewing how these grants um, are scored and what that criteria looks like. Um, again, I'll be focusing mostly primarily on the planning and implementation grant, um, but just note that some of these criteria are also applicable to the project development grant. 
Um, so to start us off, um, the first three rows um, are components or scoring criteria that are included in both grants. So that includes objectives and vision, planning activities, and transformative elements, um, and the applicant team capacity. So again, this applies to both the planning grant and implementation grant. And just note here that the difference is in the amount of points um, allocated to each grant. Um, and then for the implementation grant only, the two additional scoring criteria that are applied to this grant include the projects. And um, again, so those are the projects identified that will be integrated into the proposal. And then there is also a pro-housing policy incentive um, that offers an additional five points. Um, again, this is not a requirement, um, but optional. And I'll be reviewing all these scoring criteria in a bit more detail in the next upcoming slides. Um, and so we'll go ahead and start with the objectives and vision. And this is applicable to all grants. Um, again, if for reference, if you want to know how many points are allocated for each grant specific type, um, feel free to look at the draft guidelines. Um, at the final guidelines once those are released. So for objectives and vision, this mainly covers um, to see if the proposal has a comprehensive description of the planning or project area dependent on grant type. Um, also to see if there's a clear understanding of community needs and desired outcomes for um, priority populations. And that there is consistency with statewide planning priorities um, per the TCC guidelines. So next slide. Um, and so then the next scoring criteria applies to the applicant team capacity. And again, this covers organizational capacity and management capacity, just really to show that um, the readiness of the whole applicant team to be able to conduct the work on time and within the budget. Um, and as well as looking at the strength and diversity of partnerships. Um, um, and so again, that's looking at, you know, having a lead applicant and a set of co-applicants um, within the proposal. So next slide. Um, and as Riley mentioned, I know he covered some of the transformative elements, um, but just to kind of echo some of this information, um, planning grant applicants must describe how the planning activities they choose are related to at least one of the transformative elements listed below. Um, implementation grant applicants, they must submit documentations and, and plans for all of these transformative elements listed on this slide. Um, and again, this is really to touch on these, how these plans advance state and community goals and what their connection is. Um, so just to kind of give a brief uh, highlight of what kind of, you know, goes into these, um, each transformative element. So for community engagement, the big questions here are how will the proposed planning activities and or projects um, engage the community? How will the community stakeholders um, help design and enhance the meaningful community engagement? For displacement avoidance, you know, it's looking at how current or future policies and programs avoid the displacement of households um, and also small businesses in the area. Workforce development and economic opportunities is looking at um, what are the planning areas or project areas needs for economic development and how will these activities or projects career pathways um, for quality jobs and create economic opportunity. Um, the next is climate adaptation and resilience which is looking at how you know, the proposal is going to contribute to increasing community resilience um, to climate change impacts um, and environmental changes in the project or planning area. Um, and then leverage funding, as Riley mentioned, is match funding. So looking at match funds to support uh, the implementation for the implementation grant um, and what that can look like um, in the future for the planning grant. And the data collection and indicator tracking, again, this is only applicable to the implementation grant. And it's really looking at how um, applicants will integrate and collect data to track 
and document the progress um, of the proposed projects. Um, next slide. And so then we have um, the planning activities, and this is only applicable to the planning grant. So for this, um, applicants must identify planning activities that uh, enhance or further the, co the community vision and objectives and really demonstrate how the, these planning activities that are selected will help achieve the local and state goals, again, per TCC guidelines. Um, so this slide shows some examples of some eligible planning activities. Um, so um, I'll hit on a few, which include, you know, capacity building, um, whether that be internally or externally with partners, um, creating analysis and studies, um, designing or enhancing community engagement activities, conducting a community needs assessment or health assessment um, to begin identifying the needs within the community. Um, so again, these are some example activities, but you're not limited to just these activities. Um, again, you can work with um, the technical assistance providers if eligible to kind of um, work through which planning activities are eligible. Um, and so next slide. And so then for the implementation grant, um, implementation grants do have to uh, come in with the multiple projects that are gonna be integrated and coordinated through the whole project area as part of the proposal. And this really looks at, you know, do you have the project designs ready and the feasibility for these projects um, to be implemented, including, you know, these have to be shovel ready products and ready for implementation. So this includes, depending on the project type, you know, looking at site control, permits, CEQA. Um, again, this is all dependent on the projects. And that uh, these projects will bring multiple community effects, benefits, um, and impacts to the project area. And something that I do want to know um, that um, at least three of the projects for the implementation grant must be quantifiable and ready. And again, this is more will be more clearly defined in the round five um, guidelines. Uh, next slide. Um, so the other um, scoring criteria that is only applicable to the implementation grant is the pro housing policy incentive. And again, um, this is not required, um, but it is provided as an incentive. And so the way to receive the points here is one, if the project area is designated as a pro housing jurisdiction, or if the project area jurisdictions have applied for and are awaiting designation. Um, and again, this is just for the implementation grant. And next slide. Um, so now I'll go ahead and review the TCC application timeline. Um, so now from February through March, the technical assistance team is providing direct application TA and onboarding for tribal and unincorporated communities. Um, so if you are working, um, if your application working with any tribal or unincorporated communities, we are able to set up some time for us to meet, to kind of go over general questions or, you know, review these two grant application types, see which one may be the best fit. Again, because the round five guidelines have not been finalized or released, we can't really um, go into the uh, nuts and cracks and like details of maybe the projects or planning activities, um, but we're able to assist more broadly during this time. Um, and towards um, the end of the presentation, we'll let, give you more information on how to um, get this technical assistance during this um, pre-application phase. Um, so the final guidelines are expected to be adopted by SGC um, in February. We're looking at most likely late February with the application and notice of funding availability posted in March. Um, and so then once the application opens, um, we do have a period between April through June. Um, again, the date is not clearly defined, but within this time frame. If you are pursuing, decide to pursue a planning grant, there will be an interest survey that you will have to submit via the SGC website. Um, and then for the, if you are pursuing an implementation grant, 
um, you will have to um, submit a grant proposal. Um, again, so this is just a brief overview of what you plan, um, some of the projects, the project area, it's not the full application, it's just a brief overview of, of what you plan to propose for the application. And so then the final application submission deadline will um, be anywhere from July through August. Again, once the final guidelines are released, we hope to have more clear dates on these deadlines. Um, and then we expect around five TCC awards to be adopted by SGC in the fall of 2023. Um, next slide. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Riley and Ann, who will be providing a brief tutorial on identifying your planning or project area. Yes, thank you, Anna, and um, thank you all for um, you know listening and also uh, providing questions in the chat. Feel free to add more questions to the chat. I know that um, it may be easier to ask questions during the breakout room, but uh, if you'd like to put them in the chat, our team can try to answer them now and follow up later. Um, I actually just put something in the chat as well that you may have seen uh, via email uh, right before this workshop. And it is a link to a draft resource guide that is um, that covers both uh, the planning and implementation uh, grants, as well as um, just some sort of specific guidance for rural and unincorporated communities. Uh, so I did want to just uh, note that we've um, linked to that guide here. Um, Please note that this is a draft. It is not uh, currently confirmed as uh, ADA accessible. So if you do uh, require an ADA accessible version of this document, uh, you can reach out to SGC uh, and reach out to me as well. Uh, we can provide one as soon as possible. Um, and if anyone uh, has uh, trouble accessing Dropbox, I know there's some jurisdictions that are not able to uh, access Dropbox box links. I'm hoping that the a Google Drive link would work uh, as an alternative. And in that case, you can uh, access the um, same document at uh, this Google Drive link here. I'll just make sure the permissions are ready to go. And so what we'll be looking at today is a way that you can start on mapping your project or planning area. Um, it's through a tool called Google My Maps, uh, which is essentially a version of Google Maps that uh, you can use to um, make your own map and make a customized map. And so um, we do have a link to uh, Google My Maps in this uh, resource guide. Uh, it is on page, uh, I believe, 37, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's Appendix C of the document. And um, it is uh, a way that will uh, allow you to, you know, follow along at your own pace in your own time, if you would like, um, with the uh, mapping tutorial that we will go over today, uh, which again, this is a way to start your map. It will not allow you to do everything that you need to do to uh, complete the uh, map requirement, but that's where um, either SGC, uh, if you are not eligible for technical assistance, or um, the technical assistance team can help you finalize your map. Um, and so with that, I um, did want to just uh, turn it over to my colleague, Nan, who can help um, start the uh, mapping tutorial. OK, thanks, Riley. And give me one sec to set up the uh, Google My Maps. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Dan. Um, in the meantime, does anyone have, uh, is anyone have, having any trouble accessing this resource guide uh, that I've linked to? All right. Thank you, Nan. Uh, and just another quick note, this uh, workshop is being recorded as you uh, hopefully saw 
So uh, in addition to following the resource guide at your own pace, you can also go back and watch this recording at a later time. So with that, I will pass it to Nan and Nan can take it away. Thanks, Ravi. So hi, everybody. Again, my name is Nan. Um, and as Ravi mentioned, please feel free to follow along. Um, I also understand it's a Wednesday afternoon. So if you just want to sit back and watch me, you know, run through uh, the tutorial, that's completely fine as well. Um, the recording will be available for you, for you to review later. And we also have detailed instructions along, along with screenshots in the resource guide um, just to give you, you know, more context and more resource for you to use later on as well. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, so the first thing you want to make sure is uh, to sign in a Google account. And once you have done that, you can either go to google.com. Uh, wait, no, that's not the correct link. Uh, you, you, you can either go to mymaps.google.com or just search Google My Maps in your browser. Should take you to this website. And, and also, feel free to stop me um, if you have any questions or if you want to repeat any of the steps. But once you go to this website, you can go over here and click on this red button to create a new map. So let's do that right now. Oops, not sure why that's happening again. Um, I might just need to log in again. Yeah, sometimes um, the login process can take a little bit of extra time. Um, But yeah, but that was a demonstration of if you were not logging to your Google account, that was a step you need to go through. Uh, but once you have done that, you should be able to create a new map. There you go. All right. So this should look pretty familiar to anybody who's used Google Maps before. It's using the same um, server and base map. Um, so the first thing you can do is to rename your, your map. So right now it says um, title map here, and you can just hover your cursor over here and click on, on title map. And this little window should pop up for you. And over here, you can change the map title and also add a little description, but that's not um, necessary. So for the demonstration, I'm just gonna name this Sample map and click on save. So as you can see, you, you just change your um, untitled map into um, the new name you want. So once you have done that, um, we wanna we wanna zoom into the specific community or location you are focusing on. Um, to do that, you can you can just use the building uh, Google search function over here. So the search bar over here and just type in either the community name or certain landmarks um, or places adjacent to your project area. So for this, for this example, we're just gonna use Chicken Ranch Rancheria, which is the previous um, grantee for, this, for the TCC grant. Um, so you can type in, type in uh, the name and just search. You will see this little lime green pinpoint pop up. And once you have that, you can zoom into the location to make sure that's actually the area you want because sometimes there might be you know a few different search results coming up and you want to make sure you're selecting the, uh, the correct one. So in this example, we will select this one over here. Um, and once you click on that little pinpoint, another, another window should pop up. And over here, you can actually add this location to your map. So click on Add to Map. And you can see under your untitled layer, you, you now have a pinpoint for Chicken Ranch 
Venturia, and you can close the window. So similar to how you change your map name, you can also change your layer name. So it's the same thing, just click on Untitled Layer. Um, and again here, you can just rename, rename it to something like Project Area or whatever layer name you might prefer. And again, click on Save. So now you have a layer for um, for your for your project area, which you're also adding more information later on. Um, and once you have done that, you can close this, close all the search results. So there, your map is a little bit cleaner, and you don't see some additional information that you uh, you might not need. So let's just click close on that. And next, you want to add on a few uh, additional layers to just give you some context information, um, you know, adjacent uh, municipalities, unincorporated areas, tribal areas. So, so to make this process easier for you, we have already downloaded and created three different KMZ, like KMZ files for you to import, to import into your map. And they're going to show um, you know, the incorporated studies, unincorporated areas, and also tribal areas close to or overlapping with your project area. So the next step is just to import those three different KMZ files into your map. And to do that, we are going to use the add layer function over here. So you want to cl click on add layer. And now you have a new untitled layer. And you have the option to, in to import a file. Um, and as you mentioned, before you do this, you might also want to go, go back to the Dropbox um, Dropbox website or Google Drive, whichever one's listed in the resource guide, and just download those three different KMZ files and save them to your computer um, so you so you can import them um, into your Google My Maps. And I I have already done that. Um, so to do to now to import them into my maps, uh, you just click on import and you can select the file from your device. And I have all three of them saved in this folder over here. Um, and you do have to add them one by one. So you do need to repeat this process uh, a couple of times to add all three layers into your map. So let's do incorporated studies first. Just select that, open the file. Um, it could take a couple of minutes to upload, whereas in my case, it's not loading again, but no worries. Um, I have a different one already made. So I apologize on that. Um, sometimes you, you might just want to try a couple more times and to make sure it works, or you might want to re close your browser, um, open up Google My Maps again. Um, and anyway, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ellie. All right, Nan, I, I just wanted to pause really quickly to note, um, first of all, again, it may take a couple of tries to load these files. They're pretty large files, so they can um, just sometimes take a little bit of time. So try to be patient while loading these. Um, but the purpose of these, you know, you can also try to, to, to do the tutorial without these three files. But the reason that we recommend looking at them is that it will help you determine um, who your potential partners may be. Um, and as we'll take a look at, uh, as, as Nan will walk through next, um, based on where the um, Native American reservations are, uh, where there are cities, and where there are unincorporated areas that are specific communities within these unincorporated parts of each county, um, that will help determine who you need to partner with. So I'll turn it back to Nan. Thanks, Riley. All right. So once you have all three of those layers imported, it should show up 
um, to your Google Mind Map um, like this. So you have you now have three different three new layers for the different jurisdictions and areas. And once one, another thing to mention is once you have imported all three of those layers, your map view might zoom out to the host day again. You might not be able to see your um, your project area, the little pinpoint again. So in order to find that, just come over here and click on your chicken ranch rancheria or whatever pinpoint you have already created. Just click on that. It's going to pop up again. Um, and you can easily zoom into that area. So that's just either for you to, you know, find the find the area a little bit faster. So now you can see our locations inside a tribal area, which is a Q-shaped um, polygon here. And it's also close to some unincorporated areas and also some cities over here represented by pink and orange dots respectively. Um, and one other thing to mention is you might see all these zero, zero, zero under your three different layers. Just feel free to ignore those. They don't really represent anything that you need to pay attention to. And yeah, um, as long as all the dots um, and shapes are showing up, you, you should be good to go. All right, so once you have all that preparation work done, um, you can start drawing lines and drawing shapes on your map to start getting an idea of, your, of what your project area could look like and what just different jurisdictions in um, the area might cross over. So just to test out the drawing function, um, we're gonna start by adding adding a pin first, a pinpoint first. And the way to do that is to go right here under the search bar um, next to the little hand icon. You can see this little pinpoint and it says add marker. So if you click on that, your cursor is gonna turn to a little cross and you can just go over to the desired location. So for example, I want to, in my case, I want to mark the, the park here. I just click on the park and it's going to add this little pinpoint for me here. And similarly, you can put a name here, put a little description if you want and click on save. And now you have the pinpoint added to, to your map. Um, if you want to, either add it or remove it. You can click on the little pinpoint again. Um, you can use a little pencil to you know, add it or add any additional information. Or if you have photos or video, you can do that as well. And you can also you know, change the color of the pinpoint or have different icons for it. Um, those are all available to you. And you can also remove this pinpoint um, if you place it accidentally or if you just want to remove it from your map. So let's go ahead and remove that. Okay, so so next we let's let's draw a line. Um, and to do that you want to come over here to this little draw a line function icon. So click on that it's going to give you four different options. So in our case, um, we are only going to use the first one, add line or shape. The other ones might not be super relevant to most people on here. Um, so feel free to ignore those. Um, but for this demonstration, I'm just going to show you how to um, show you the first the first one. So if you click on that. Again, your cursor is going to turn to the little cross icon. Um, and let's draw a line first. So to draw the line, you want to come over to the first point of your line, the starting point of your line. So click on that. And you can see you can move this line around to different directions and to make it 
um, to different lengths. So once you reach your, um, your endpoint, just click on that or double click on that. And now you have a line. And again, you can change the name, add description, save the line. Um, and, you can, and you now have a line. Um, and one of the things that's very, that could be useful as well is it also shows you, shows you the length of the line in, um, in the distance of the line, the length of the line in real life. So that could come, come up really handy for you as well. Um, and you can move the line around, edit the line a little bit as well if you want. Um, and again, you can edit the line or remove, remove the line. Um, completely. So to draw a shape, it's using the same steps as drawing a line. So again, you click on this icon and go to add line or shape. Um, and similarly, you're going to start with your starting point and then go to the second point of your shape. Um, however, this time you just click once instead of clicking twice. That way you can keep on going to the next point on your shape. So let's re let's say we're drawing a triangle here. It's going to be my third point. And you should always go back to your starting point to complete your drawing and to complete the shape. So just click on just click once on the starting point again. And now we have a polygon or a shape. And again, add name, additional information for that. Um, and this is also going to give you information on acreage, on the area of the shape. So um, that should also be really, really useful for you in sort of determining your project area um, and trying to figure, or and also for you to try to try to figure out whether that fits into any requirements you might have, um, et cetera. Okay, so let's remove that for now. Um, okay, so those are the three basic drawing functions you can you can use on in, on Google Maps and those are probably the three most common ones you you will need to have um well join your your own project area. Um, and to just wrap this up, um, I'm just gonna draw a really random shape that includes the chicken wrench um interior area and the unincorporated Jamestown area and also the city of Sonora just to show you you know how how you can draw uh, kind of, that kind of shape and also demonstrate sort of your project area encompassing um, different tribal you know and unincorporated areas incorporated cities etc um, so similarly, we are going to use a line or shape function. Um, and to just do that, you can you can place as many points as you want on the map. So your shape can really look like, you know, um, just a very random shape, or it doesn't need to conform to any um, really any. requirements or um, shapes or conventions. So I'm just quickly doing this over here and just to, and while doing that, you can still zoom in and zoom out if you to give yourself a little bit more, um, you know, context information. And another very neat thing is if you're drawing around a shape, your cursor is actually just going to you know, attach on to the shape automatically. So if you do want to have 
sort of the boundaries of a particular shape, also as even boundaries of your project area. That could be a really, really easy way, easy way for you to you know, draw those boundaries. So I'm just gonna close this out for now. And you can see I have this big polygon over here encompassing those three different types of areas I just mentioned. So it's gonna save for now. And again, you can view some of the acreage and lens um, information for the shape over here as well. Um, yes, I think that's pretty much, um, you know, the demonstration over here and also some of the basic functions you would need for to start drawing your project area or just to start getting an idea of what it could look like. Um, it's gonna pause here to see if Riley has anything to add or to see if anybody has questions or maybe you want me to go back to any of the steps. Um, yeah, it's gonna pause here. Thank you so much, Nan. Uh, that was really great. And uh, I did want to note a couple things. Um, I did mention in the chat that the area will show up uh, as square miles if you uh, draw a shape that's larger than uh, one half 0.5 square miles. Uh, that's about 315 acres, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, so you can also, and one other thing I'd like to note is that this shape uh, here, um, the one other requirement about shapes is they do need to connect to each other. So in this case, um, they are connected. There's sort of a straight line at one point. So we would, I would probably suggest um, if you were drawing the shape to try to um, have a little bit more of a clear connection between the Sonora and the Jamestown portion, um, just to show that you have a contiguous is the word project area. Uh, but in um, in this process, you know, this is something that the technical assistance team can help you with. Um, SGC can also provide assistance uh, with this for non-TA recipients. Uh, but I think that's about it. Any questions from the audience about the mapping tutorial specifically? All right, well, hearing none, uh, I think we can go ahead and move on to um, the final few slides. Uh, we'll talk about the technical assistance process and then move back into our uh, breakout rooms. And so with that, I will pass it, um, you know, as we uh, pull up those next couple of slides, um, we'll be returning to the timeline and I'll pass it back to Anna. Great, thank you, Riley and Ann, um, for providing that tutorial. Um, so again, this is just another uh, re um, slide, um, again, showing the timeline um, in case you may have missed it the first time. Um, but again, right now we're in the pre-application phase, which will run through March. So for we will, the technical assistance team will be providing direct application um, technical assistance, specifically onboarding tribal and unincorporated communities. The final guidelines are expected to be adopted by SGC um, late February with the application and uh, NOPA posted in March. Um, and again, depending on the application grant type, um, there are some in-between deadlines before the final application submission um, over the summer. Um, so we go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I, I know we've really mentioned this throughout the workshop, um, but again, technical assistance um, is a core function of the TCC program. Um, and TA is provided throughout the application phase of the program um, to all implementation grant applicants. So if you um, do proceed an implementation grant, this is a requirement. Um, and then technical assistance is available to eligible planning applicants only. Um, so TA providers will be supporting applicants from tribal communities and rural and unincorporated communities with technical assistance for these TCC planning grants. Um, unfortunately, technical assistance is not currently available for 
other planning applicants, um, but SGC staff will be able to answer questions and assist um, um, planning applicants who are not in tribal or unincorporated communities. And so, um, again, this technical assistance is provided to support um, TCC applicants in the development of their um, application. And an overview of some of the services that we provide is listed here on the slide. Um, again, um, we can help with, uh, if you have questions on any of the guidelines or any clarifications, if you have any questions on project eligibility, planning activities, um, or as noted a bit earlier, if you need assistance with developing um, that planning or project area, um, as well as doing some of the more technical um, portions of the application. Um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and again, pre-application technical assistance is available for unincorporated communities. Um, and again, the way to be able to do this is that we have an intake survey. So if you have not done so, um, you can go ahead and fill out the intake survey, which we'll be posting in the chat shortly. Um, and this is basically to kind of start that onboarding process where you will meet with the technical assistance team to kind of um, get a, a brief overview of, you know, whether it's general questions you may have and or looking to see what application grant may be best for, for you. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to the technical assistance team um, if for any rural or unincorporated and tribal planning applicants. Um, this is also including implementation applicants. Feel free to reach out to um, Estelon Advisors. Um, we're at Riley at EstelonAdvisors.com or feel free to reach out to um, CCRH. Um, and where you can go is at Clancy at, California, at CalRuralHousing.org. Um, and then just knowing the typo that that should only be one um, at site. Um, and for any other um, planning applicants that are not eligible for technical assistance, we encourage you to contact um, SGC TCC staff at tcc at sgc.california.gov. Um, and again, um, right now we'll be opening um, some breakout rooms um, to further answer any questions and answers. Um, and I also want to take a note to highlight that we do have um, an SGC staff member um, online now. So this is Anna Jane Jones. So if you have any questions that need to be directed to SGC, um, she'll be able to answer those. Um, so with that, um, we can go and lead into the breakout rooms. So we will have, be having two breakout rooms um, with, along with the main room. So the main room will be open for those who have just general questions, um, not pertaining to any specific grant type. Um, breakout room number one will be those for people who are interested in applying to the implementation grant. And room two will be open for those who are interested in applying to the planning grant or are undecided. Um, so I see that the breakout rooms are now open. So feel free to join the breakout room of your choice. And if you're having any issues joining a breakout room, um, feel free to either come, come off mute or um, put it in the chat and we can direct you to the correct breakout room. <clears throat> 